We will get started in officially two minutes. And Danielle, it's, there's still people in the waiting room. Did you disable it? I did. That's why I don't understand. Okay. And I started recording. Great. Yep, Lynn, so if, if that happens again, if you could just keep enabling people to join. Okay. That'd be great. Good morning, good morning. Welcome, welcome. We're gonna get started in one minute with introductions. Good morning. Good morning. Good Thank morning. you for saying hello in the chat. I'm gonna be asking you to participate a little bit in the chat. So hopefully go ahead and introduce yourself. We're gonna have a great learning experience together. Good morning from Japan, Philippines. Good morning from, ba good morning from Bangkok. From, good morning from Bangkok. Yes. From Singapore. Have, All right. Uh, Vietnam. All right, we could probably get started with introductions. Okay. If you're ready. Good good morning to everyone except those of us here in the US, which is good evening. <laughs> uh, it's our pleasure to, uh, to introduce to you Danielle Sullivan, uh, who is with Curriculum Associates and who, as you can see from the title, is going to be sharing with us some pretty interesting stuff this evening. And uh, I want to, before we begin, I want to thank uh, Curriculum Associates for stepping forward and actually sponsoring this event. Morning. Uh, and it's really, a uh, hopefully it's a it's a step to a new a new way of doing our webinars to have some of the many uh, companies that support ERCOS uh, step in and and support a particular presenter uh, much like we do when we have uh, conferences with you know in real space in real time uh, but in any event uh, they're the first to step forward to do this and I I can't think of a more appropriate topic uh, than taking a look at what we've learned uh, because we've got a lot of learning that we've 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 had, but I think we're going to be carrying it forward for quite a bit of time. So it's good to do some reflecting on where we've been, and where we're going, and what we've learned. So uh, curriculum associates, uh, Charlotte and Lynn, thank you so much for bringing this to the Irkos region. Uh, Danielle, we really look forward to hearing from you tonight, and to the rest of you. Uh, congratulations on all you're doing and the success you're having in your schools in these tough times. I look forward to spending uh, the next hour plus with all of you and, and enjoying what we're going to hear from Danielle. Danielle, thank you so much for being with us. You are most welcome. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm excited to be here with you. Hopefully you can see my screen. And if you wouldn't mind just staying muted, uh, for the presentation, that would be great. That way we can have a clean recording, but I would love to hear from you in the chat for sure. So like they, uh, Ed shared, I'm one of the national directors here at Curriculum Associates, which basically means I have the pleasure and privilege of supporting educators, well, globally. So I'm really excited to be here today to share things we've learned. Little fun fact about me, I'm actually presenting to you from upstate New York, where I am on sharing land with some goats. I'm presenting from a shed and we've been living in a, an RV all summer, which has been really, really fun. And before I did all of this, I was in education. I was, a well, I'm in education now. Ha ha, I was a teacher. I taught fifth and sixth grade special education in um, United States in two different states. So who are we at Curriculum Associates? I just wanna start by sharing that we do everything with a core set of values, including high integrity, measure our success by the impact of students and educators. We embrace all, say it like it is, low ego, and we offer high quality service. This is just one of the opportunities that we love to partner with organizations to offer really just interesting ideas and different types of content. So that's what we are going to be talking about today. But first, I would love to do a check-in with you. So if you wouldn't mind taking a deep breath, How are you feeling today? Go ahead and type in the chat. 
I have a branded feelings chart here, but there are more than nine feelings in the human experience. So feel free to go off chart, or you could also identify as a screaming animal. So either one, you can either write which screaming animal you identify with, or you could just write in the chat how you're feeling today. So we've got some curious, great, excited for a new day. Excited, curious, excited. Hello, relax. Ooh, we got some relax, that's great. Thank you so much, keep them coming. Oh, we have some calm, a lot of curious. Well, it's been a challenging couple of years. In fact, we thought this year would be a little bit different. Everyone was planning, everyone was excited, and then bam, another variant. Whoo, what a start to the year. Maybe you felt like one of my bitmojis on the screen. I don't, we had a couple of come out in the United States and now my clicker stopped working. Okay, there we go. In um, March of 2020, this article was published on medium.com. I don't know if you saw this, but what's happened with us as humans, which is really interesting, is that when a crisis happens, we have something called a surge capacity. So you're able to handle certain things. Like if there was an emergency in your family or there's an, a, a natural disaster, we as humans, we have a certain amount of extra energy that we pull from in order to react to the situation. Well, unfortunately, our surge capacity has been depleted and unfortunately has been depleted for a while. Then this article came out in the Washington Post here in the US in August by more psychologists trying to just share what's happening with everybody. So now they're calling it pandemic flux syndrome. So it's when the surge capacity was super depleted and we're still tired. Well, whew, how do we address all of this? How do you address all this and still stay sane? That's what we're gonna talk about today because the best thing to do is learn from the past because success leaves clues. So today we are gonna talk about the top 10 lessons that we've learned from this crazy year, 2020 to 21. Now we have the pleasure and privilege of supporting over 10 million students with iReady at Curriculum Associates. So the lessons that I'm sharing with you today have been pulled from teacher interviews, leader interviews, case studies, our social media digs, plus things that I've read and seen. And we also, uh, in the past year, just like you all have done, we pivoted and had a lot of our content virtually. So this is a year of learning. So I'm gonna share with you some best practices from all of that research. And I also will share some really great resources. Now, everything that we share today, we will include in the chat. It is free to access. And we will also send a follow-up care package email with the recording and all these resources. So let's get to it. Number 10. So that again, if you've ever watched David Letterman, we're gonna count down from 10. So number 10, what we learned it's so important to set reasonable expectations. Here's, so I'm gonna share some quotes from real educators just like yourselves. It goes back to the same thing, consistency. We've been doing this for years. It's just part of the culture, it's a norm. So how can we continue to set expectations? Back in 2019, we had a time machine. <laughs> There's an organization in the United States called the New Teacher Project they put out a report called the Opportunity Myth. This report was pretty revolutionary. I don't know if you've heard of it. If you have not, it's available on the internet for free. It's really impactful. And what they studied is what's happening with the gaps in education. Where are there really opportunities for students to be successful? And what they found was pretty shocking. There's a lot of, uh, <laughs> a lot of stuff that's not quite working, as you can imagine. But I love this quote because what they found, they said the system doesn't send teachers the message that their mindset matters nearly as much as the materials they teach or the practices they employ in their classrooms. Yet teacher expectations had a stronger impact on student achievement growth than any other factor they studied. I have read that in multiple different research studies. Your expectations as leaders, teachers matters. However, 
with a shift to virtual learning. I think many of you are still in virtual learning. We still need to adjust or set reasonable expectations. That's what we've learned in this uh, hybrid environment. So you wanna adjust the expectation to match the year. I interviewed probably 30 educators, just myself for a podcast that we have at Curriculum Associates. And every single educator we talked to throughout the year was really hard on themselves saying, I wish I did more. I should have done this. Stop putting shoulds on yourself. You can hold the high expectations, but it's okay to adjust them a little bit given the circumstance. However, consistency is still important. We still want students to know that we believe in them. We still want students to know that we care. And we still want students to know that not only do we believe that in them, but we know that they can achieve to their highest levels. That still has not changed. What we expect, we get. If you don't have the high expectations, how will your students have high expectations for themselves? Routines always work. Virtual, hybrid, in-person, really strong academic routines will help solidify those expectations in classrooms. And finally, with expectations, you wanna be proactive, not reactive. You wanna lay out expectations at the beginning, middle, during, end, all the time. It is not too late to set high expectations, to share them with students. And if you are a leader, sharing them with teachers and teachers with students, and then of course with families. So that is number 10 lesson learned, set reasonable expectations. And let's assume kids are more capable than we think. Nine, let's keep using technology effectively. We don't wanna leave any child behind. Now, notice it says keep using technology effectively. When this first happened in March of 2020, it seemed like everybody was coming out with an online platform. Do you agree? Did you, there was like, do I, I mean, I didn't even know what Zoom was. How many of you knew what Zoom was, right? Zoom's now it's like an adjective, just like Kleenex is an adjective for tissue. It's crazy. Zoom is like a thing or a verb, excuse me, all of it. It's a verb, it's an adjective, it's a noun. Nobody knew what it was before, but now you do. But every, everyone came out with a new technology. It's like, you can use this and a Padlet and a Nearpod and a this. That's amazing, but you're going to confuse the heck out of everybody. So choose what you like, use them well, and do not get into a tech rabbit hole. So if you have a, a, a device or a extra, maybe it's Padlet, maybe it's Nearpod. I, we do not endorse any of those things. But if there's another technology that works really well for you, great. Just pick one. That's what we've learned. Less is more. Families can get overwhelmed students can get overwhelmed. You're gonna see a theme, <laughs> consistency is still key. What didn't work is when educators tried many different things. I'm gonna put up this video on YouTube, then you're gonna go into Zoom and then you're gonna watch something in Nearpod. No, that's crazy. So just choose a couple, but be consistent with it. Another helpful thing is enlarging your cursor making it really big. So if you're actually doing a virtual presentation and you have to point to something, having the cursor really big can be very powerful. Using virtual manipulatives and virtual tools if you are in a fully virtual environment, that's something else that educators found very helpful. And finally, this, you would think that this would make, this is kind of common sense, but you want to make sure that all students can access whatever technology you're using. It's been fascinating watching the children in my life and the families in my life struggle when it was all virtual, that the parents were so frustrated because they didn't know which link because their teacher kept sending a different link every day. Please don't do that. That's just, it's just not helpful. So how can you continue to make sure you're using the technology effectively? Number eight, making resources easily accessible to everyone. 
Our students deserve instruction designed to meet their needs and instruction that will catapult them toward reaching their greatest potential. So how do we make these resources easily accessible? Make sure students have what they need. So if you are in a fully remote environment, make sure they have access to what they need to be successful. Tech checks. Did you check in with them? Do they have the right technology? Um, we know here in the United States, there were so many issues with internet, especially in rural counties. So when things started to go virtual, a huge push was just to make sure students could have access to the internet. Offline resources still are very effective. So if you are planning a lesson and you want students to engage, even something like a paper and pencil, or giving them access to printed lessons, that can be very powerful, especially now that we're two years into this, there's a lot of Zoom fatigue. Anybody, anybody know what I'm talking about? A little, little Zoom fatigue, right? Educators found a lot of success doing this. I don't know if any of you've tried this, but having a website, one place where all of your resources live. I know a lot of educators have used a learning management system. Uh, Google Classroom seems to be very popular with a lot of districts we work with. And then some educators use that Google uh, Teacher Classroom page that has all of the links right there in one place. So let me show you what that looks like. We have a resource for you that we'll put in the chat. Again, it is free to access, but it's called iReady Central Ideas. So at Curriculum Associates, we have an assessment program and instruction program called iReady. And it's pretty awesome, but that's not what we're talking about today. But what we do is we wanna gather educators together. So we give them a lot of support and resources. And a couple of years ago, we thought it would be a great idea to create a shared resource page, kind of like a Pinterest, where educators can share really cool ideas of what they're doing in their classrooms. So that is what this website is. It gives you a lot of great ideas about using data and assessment, whatever that data is that you're using, but just really great ideas on motivating students and, and engaging students like this. This teacher shows uh, creating one location, her virtual office space, where this is where her students know to get all of the resources. So when I say make it accessible, make sure students can totally, um, and, and families can make sure they get all the resources they need, this is what I'm talking about. And the last thing is providing when appropriate or when you can a hard copy of lessons so students can get what they need. Whew. All right, I'm taking a minute and pause. Neuroscience tells us that we need to chunk and chew information for it to get stored from our short-term to long-term memory. So I want to hear from you, based on the last three things we just shared, what's standing out for you? Do you do some of these things? And whatever you want to type in the chat is great. So I'm going to give you a minute to just take it in before we keep going. And I'm going to do a trick. It's called a creepy smile. So when you wait for people to type in the chat, that's what you do. You just smile at them. Smile helps. Danielle, you have someone asking if you can show slide for number nine again. Yes. Was that helpful? All right. Thank you, Tom. Virtual office space, trying that out. Use Pear Deck for my language lessons whenever we had to do virtual learning. Less is more is the most important thing you've, great, less is more, yes. I mean, sometimes we tend to way overcomplicate things. Do tech tools, right, technology's lagging right now for some of you. <laughs> Consistency is key, reasonable expectations, less is more, mindset matters, small things like making your cursor larger and other tricks. Wonderful, okay, great. Great job, everybody. Now we're gonna keep Moving on to number seven. So we did the tech. Now we talked about making it accessible. Seven is how do we use our resources that we have very strategically? Because we have less 
time, unfortunately. In a virtual environment, you're gonna have less time. Even um, if some of you are back in buildings here in the US, a lot of our teachers and students are back in the buildings, but because of social distancing guidelines or COVID restrictions, it's still cut into class time. So how can we use what we have very strategically? From a teacher, Tracy, I expect the entire school year will continue to be a balancing act for teachers as well as students. It still is. It's still a balancing act. So how can we use our resources strategically? Just because you have it doesn't mean you need to use it. I'll let you that sink in for a second. Sometimes you get really excited. I used to do this when I was a teacher, having so many resources. And I was like, look at this thing. And now take this notebook and then let's go to this resource. That can get very confusing very fast. So what do you have that's really great? What is your core? And if you have data, so if you use iReady, we really think about this. We make sure that we have uh, some really great reports to help educators with unfinished learning. And then all of our resources live in one login for teachers, one. So you're not looking in a million places. So if you have a great data and assessment system, that's wonderful because a universal screener can really help you know where to start so you know what to use. Do not give them busy work. I mean, when I was a teacher around holidays, we would have students do coloring sheets in sixth grade. I know, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of things I would change if I could go back in time. It's really important to just focus on the essential work. You wanna maximize time. That's what we learned last year. That's what we wanna take forward with us. Streamline as much as you can and you wanna maximize the time you have with students. So if you are still in a virtual environment, use that time to maybe answer questions instead of doing explicit instruction, maybe flip it. That worked a lot um, for a lot of the teachers we interviewed, that also worked. Or teachers recorded videos and then use their live time with students to do more of a workshop. It's getting creative. Okay, we have some things in the chat. Variety instructional techniques is key, but consistency in technology. Yes, I totally agree. Like once you have the same technology, be consistent there. And absolutely you wanna be creative with the way you engage with students. So we have another free resource for you. If you're interested in uh, or need more resources in a virtual environment, we've gone very um, great lengths to make sure that teachers have what they need. So we have a website that's going to give you free resources, including uh, assessment supports, instruction supports. We even have more webinars that we've done all year. We have, there is a really wonderful uh, educator we work with called Anita Archer. She's helped, be, she, she's helped us design a phonics program for struggling older readers. And she did this really amazing webinar around a lot of, of these strategies I'm sharing with you too. But that's, all, that's available for free. Dr. Anita Archer is right there. Um, a lot of really great resources. So this is a treasure trove of free resources for you. And we put the link in the chat, but we'll also send this to you in a care package. Number six, engage families frequently. It is mostly about connecting. Once you make the connection with their parents and they know we have the best interests of child, their child at heart. So what we've learned, which is very interesting because not only have we learned this, but I've also read they've done research on interviewing families and what worked during the height of COVID. It's not gonna surprise you, building relationships. The most impactful educators who really showed a lot of growth to their students, even despite virtual whatever, they reached out to each family individually. Share your expectations with families. Be transparent with them. Let the family know that you believe in their child. Communicate with them on wherever they hang out. This is where you can use a lot of different technology. If they're on Facebook, educators have gone to Facebook. If families are in Twitter, educators have tweeted to families, emailed, called. They really tried to reach families wherever families were hanging out. 
Also, family data chats. Whatever universal screener you have, it's really important to share that data with families and empower families to be enrolled in their child's progress. And share resources, share your website, make sure they have the one place to go so they're not super confused, but it's very, very important. We know that we've really, uh, we struggled a lot with family communication in the beginning of iReady. We're at our 10 year anniversary of iReady. We've come a long way and we have a family center which is available in different languages that we wanna welcome families to be able to understand what we offer. So as a school, do you have a family website? As a leader, um, do you regularly engage with families? But having a place for them to go to learn about what you're doing is so important. If you partner with us at iReady, or if you just are curious of better templates or things or ways to engage families, we have free resources, templates, ideas, tips, all sorts of things that you can absolutely use even if you don't partner with us, just ways to make sure that families feel included. All right, let's pause again. What did you hear? What do you wonder? And how do you currently engage with families? Give you a moment to type in the chat. And yes, I will absolutely talk about a family data chat. Wait a second to let people type in the chat. I'll go back a little bit. Whoops. And talk about what that means. Methods chat on Seesaw. Great, doing all of the above. Send them a WhatsApp, email via Alma. Streamline, focus on what's relevant. Just keep them coming, keep typing in the chat. So what we mean by a family data chat, at iReady we offer a universal screener K-12. It's an adaptive diagnostic. And from that, students have, students and educators have data on where, their where students are performing in reading and math. We encourage educators to share that information with families. So whatever assessment data you use, a data chat is just sharing how that child is performing on that assessment. So families know, and they're not in the dark of what's happening in school. A data chat can be uh, my nephews in kinder or nieces in kindergarten. Her teacher just sends home her work of the week. That is a way of communicating with families, but a data chat would be the teacher to set up a time to talk to the family members about what's happening in school. Hopefully that was helpful, Shane. Class Dojo, I love Class Dojo. Voice recorded feedback. Do any of the schools use the platform? Wait a second, platform Discord. Oh, so somebody was asking about Discord. I've never heard of Discord, but if you have, go ahead and type in the chat. Class Dojo, PTA meetings. You guys are typing a lot of great technology that I've never even heard of. Students use Discord, but not endorsed by the school. Um, great, great conversation happening in the chat. Wonderful. That's the thing. There's so much out there. There's so many platforms, so many things. Whatever you find to work with you and your students and your families, again, less is more. Number five, celebrate successes, big and small. Kyle, fifth grade math teacher, my classroom revolves around data-driven small groups. So having to adjust and adapt to that dynamic to make sure everyone was safe while also continuing to deliver rigorous leveled instruction was the biggest challenge, but ultimately one of the biggest successes. Many of you might feel this way. I know educators are still feeling this way. You know you need to teach grade level content. However, the students are coming to you with greater need than ever before. So how are you managing all of this? We work with educators every single day answering that question. Celebrating successes big and small is one step in that direction. Making sure students feel validated, affirmed, and successful. A lot of educators actually wrote handwritten notes, especially if they didn't see their students or they're still in a virtual environment. A handwritten note home could make a world of difference with some students. 
recording personalized videos to share with families. I've seen this uh, work very, very well. I've heard educators talk about this, but just saying like, and this wasn't public on YouTube. They literally just recorded a video saying, hey, Johnson family, I just wanted to let you know that Sheila did an amazing job in school today. I was really proud of her. Keep up the good work. What was that? Like 15 seconds? That can go a long way. You could record it on your phone, email it, text it to them, WhatsApp it to them. But personalized messages really can help this child feel important. Leveraging social media. I know social media is a um, love and pain relationship for a lot of people, but I've seen a lot of educators celebrate successes using social media. And that way, families have seen that, felt really good about it, and then that's gained traction. So using social media to celebrate the successes and the wins can also be very effective. Awards, incentives, and competition. No matter which environment you're in, if you're in a virtual environment, hybrid environment, in the buildings, all of these always work. But you want to focus on intrinsic first, which is where we focus a lot of the other lessons learned, making sure that you're establishing the right systems, making sure students understand where they're performing, feeling that we want them to intrinsic, but awards and incentives for any progress also goes a long way. And I've seen a lot of success with competitions especially if you're trying to get to a goal or if you're utilizing a data program and you want different classes to compete against each other, you can have a lot of fun in a whole school building. Virtual parties. Once you've hit a milestone, once students have achieved something, having a virtual party, it can be really, really fun and satisfying, plus help students connect. And I see that there's a question in the chat I'll answer in one minute. Um, we've, we've seen school cheering squads having uh, students dress up and even going from room to room when you were in the building or a virtual cheering squad. And then this was a lot of fun with uh, some of the younger students is having a show and tell with families where families would come into Zooms, showing pets, sharing stuffed animals, sharing really great things that happen in their lives. All of this really makes a huge difference. High School Spirit Week, yes! Um, David asked, what do you recommend or have you seen taken off the plate for teachers with all of these items being added? Data conversations, personalized videos. That's a great question. That's the thing. Things aren't being taken off educators' plates. <laughs> so this is where I'm sharing ideas of what worked. But wait till we get to the last lesson because things aren't being taken off. So you need to manage what does work and pick and choose what can work. You can't do everything. You can't, you can't do all of it. So that's why this is just, there's some ideas that work. I can tell you that data conversations are really powerful or any opportunities to connect. So if you need to choose one, I would choose connection every time, but that's just me. So what are some ideas? Again, I ready central idea page. This teacher, I interviewed him on the podcast. He is so much fun. He would just record videos for his students and sing. That's what he would do. He would just sing to the students, especially when they were apart. Like he would record a, once a week, a fun song for the students and send it home. Just really fun. This is a really cool idea about award confetti cards. So again, this is, has to do with iReady. You don't have to use iReady to use these ideas. If students reach a milestone in your class, maybe they got great grades and assessment that you just took or showed a lot of growth, having these confetti cards to help them feel success really goes a long way. Celebrating progress, um, this teacher dressed up like a taco. If her, if her students reach a certain milestone, she dressed up like a taco. I've seen leaders uh, have incentives where they've been literally duct taped to a wall. So once the student, the building did enough growth, the principal was taped to the wall. That's super fun. Um, they have how, oh, I love houses in middle school and high school. The house system is so cool. I've seen that work in so many um, middle and high schools like Harry Potter sorting system. You give monthly prizes, goodies for good classroom behavior. Um, celebrating with a virtual dance party. I mean, who doesn't love a virtual dance party? What, what? 
And if you're in class having an in-person dance party, but students really love this and it helps to move. It's just good for your body all across the board. Okay. Is there a question in the chat, Lynn? And I would love to hear from you while uh, Lynn asked me this question, what are you doing to celebrate growth with your students? What are you doing to celebrate the wins? Um, yes. Yeah. So Shane asked, uh, he said, I'm not sure if you'll discuss this, but do you have any feedback from people who deliver a prescribed curriculum with external assessments? Okay, ask that one more time. Maybe Shane wants to come off mute. Do you have any feedback from people who deliver a prescribed? Go ahead, Shane. Um, it, it's just for, for diploma program teachers. Um, we have very, very heavy curriculum. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the, the, you know, for, for teachers in um, curriculum where you control your assessment, you can modify your, your content, but we can't. And, and, and these, these, these courses are very, very high stakes for kids because, mm -hmm. of course, this is what gets them into university. So I'm, I'm just wondering if you have any feedback from, from people that are, whether it be an, uh, a diploma program teacher or some other, uh, like an IGCSE curriculum where, where they don't control the, uh, the final assessments. Yes. Thank you, Shane. And thanks for coming off of mute. I really appreciate it. You may not control the final assessments and you have a, a curriculum that you absolutely have to teach, but what you can control is the way you deliver it. And what you can control is the systems you have in place on the how to deliver it. And that's what we're talking about in some of these things. Making sure the students know that you believe in them, making sure that the students, that you build relationships with the students, you connect with the students, and you are all in the shared vision together working towards that goal. And also incorporating some breaks because in high pressure situations, given the pandemic, well, given previous, right? A lot of times students in those courses are gonna put a ton of pressure on themselves. Is that correct? Does that happen? A lot of pressure on students? Probably. Yes. We, we see that a lot. We see that a lot. A lot of perfectionism. Students really need to make sure that they're performing at their best. So just a lot of empathy and human elements. Um, in the United States, we're calling it social emotional learning. I'll also say human connection. So that is the most important piece right now, letting kids know that you're a champion for them. Even though you have that curriculum to teach, there's an assessment at the end, everyone's moving in the right direction, but still letting them know that you're there for them, that can make a really big impact. It doesn't take a lot of time to do that. Smiling, letting them know, having um, sharing the expectations, a lot of these best practices can still apply. Hopefully that helped. Would help without being Pollyanna. Um, okay, then we've had some people are really excited about houses in the chat. So keep talking to each other in the chat. Even if you don't have that as a school-wide incentive, you could have houses or different uh, sorting elements even in your classroom, no matter what your curriculum it is. There's a lot of ways you can structure things to still help students thrive and feel validated and affirmed. Which brings me to number four how uh, ways that we've learned for students to own their learning. Crystal, my students display the leader in themselves with my guidance every year because I believe that you don't have to be a title to be a leader, the leader is in you. So how can we get students to own their learning? First off, help them stay organized, especially if you're still in a virtual environment, I mean, I used to teach middle school and it was really challenging to get middle schoolers to fill out a planner. Uh, one time I accidentally put my hand in their backpack. Don't ever do that with a middle schooler. You don't know what you're gonna find. So have, helping them get organized. So if, again, just like I said for you as educators, less is more. Maybe there's a paper agenda, a digital agenda. Maybe there's data trackers they can use, but really helping students organize their goals and their, their data and their learning can be very impactful. Using SMART goals, we recommend a lot with digital, uh, with our personalized instruction, something called an interactive notebook. 
So whatever person, maybe if they're watching a video or they're watching you or you're in a virtual lesson, having them have a notebook where they can record their thoughts and ideas, and then you give them feedback. Feedback has been very uh, impactful. It's actually, has anyone ever heard of John Hattie, Visible Learning? Anybody? Bueller, anybody? Great. If you haven't, John Hattie is a, he's actually an international researcher. He studies the highest impact <clears throat> strategies in education. What makes learning visible? And he shares feedback is a very high impact strategy. So interactive notebooks help students own their learning and it helps validate them because they know that you care because you're giving them the feedback. Let me take a minute. I get so excited, I need some water. Again, consistent data chats. Now, when I say data, I basically mean progress. How are they, are students aware of how they're progressing in class? Do they know what their goals are? Is everyone sharing that vision? Are they moving towards that same direction together, including you, family members, and them? If they know where they need to go to grow, they will start to pay attention more. Another big thing, getting them to own their learning, helping them by you being a champion for them. Get to know them. Get to know what they're interested in. Ask them, build trust with them. All of these are so powerful practices, especially now, because more and more you read in the news and any education, I read education news every single day, and there's at least one article talking about students' mental well being. And the biggest differentiator is an adult who cares. And how can students monitor their own progress? How are they in charge of their learning? If you're using a digital platform or you're, um, if they're taking some personalized instruction, do they know if they're passing the lesson? Are they keeping track of that? All of these are best practices to help them own their learning. And of course, families every step of the way. So ideas that we have again from I Ready Central Ideas, creating a check-in. This middle school teacher used a virtual check-in that she actually had students fill out multiple times a day, then started tracking their data. And she saw times of the day where her students were dipping in energy and she adjusted it. This educator used a check-in, uh, same thing, used a different virtual check-in and helped them understand that they are there for her. And they shared some really interesting things. She found out that some uh, of her students were food insecure. She was able to bring in some other resources for these families, but these educators found a lot of things by just asking students to fill out an inventory. Other high quality practices, basically back to even what Shane asked, how do you help students set and track their own goals? At iReady, we believe in the power of data-driven instruction. We believe that if students know where they need to go in order to grow, they will see success. So whatever data system you use, whatever curriculum you use, we have a lot of great ideas on how to set goals with students. We give you resources on how to set goals with students and then how to track those goals. And I keep mentioning this <laughs> because what I've seen, I've been in education, oh gosh, for 25 years, I've been in the field of education. I have seen myself, plus read the research, the biggest differentiator between students who grow and students who don't grow is students that know where they need, I, now I'm just rhyming for you, but honestly, if they understand their data, if they are enrolled in it, if they know where they start and where they need to go, they will start to own their learning. So, which is why we really push the power of data chats. And um, Haley just shared this in the chat. We have lots of opportunities for data chats. You don't have to use iReady. Again, free resources, really good questions to ask students and with families too. All right, we have some stuff in the chat. We have a class virtual assignment notebook for each class grade level. It's a simple Google Doc or Google um, Calendar. Yes, Celeste. It doesn't have to be complicated, but having students have that notebook feedback, it's so powerful. All right, Whew, how are we doing? I'd love to hear it from you because we're on to our last three. How do you engage students? 
How do you make sure that uh, students are owning their learning? What are some other best practices that you do? Go ahead and just type in the chat. Take a minute, a creepy smile for 30 seconds. While you type some ideas in the chat. And let's make sure team to export the chat because there's been a lot of wonderful uh, conversation that I would love to capture in the chat this morning too. Okay, who's gonna tell me how to do that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> progress over perfection perfect <laughs> Haley's on it all right if you want to keep sharing I love all the sharing that's happening in the chat ways you're engaging students so or or owning their learning but number three so we keep whittling it down we need to engage students above all above all Amanda 2020 has reminded me just how important it is to teach the students interests Active student engagement is way more important than any curricula. And I got some stuff in the chat for my Spanish classes. I do one-on-one -on -one interviews with each of my kiddos and let them know what levels that they're at. Woo, good job. For virtual classes, it's important to follow up on absences. Yes, Jason, there's so many students that we're missing this year. So many students. Uh, once a month, she does the interviews. We have two weekly progress reports for every student. We encourage them to set SMART goals based on their reports. Yes. Oh, such great ideas. Thank you, everyone who's typing in the chat, because you are all doing an amazing job. So how do we make sure that no matter what, no matter what curriculum we use, students are engaged above all? Number one, <laughs> this is again from John Hattie. We need to make learning visible. What do I mean by that? If you are in classrooms, do you have students uh, score, not scores, but their work on the wall? Are there goals on the wall? Is they, can they see what the progress is? How can we make learning more visible? That's why we talk about the data chats. That's why we're talking about goal setting. That's why people are sharing great ideas in the chat around ways that students are enrolled and owning their learning. If they see it, they'll believe it. So we can ask for frequent responses. So if you're teaching in the virtual environment, call and response, asking students to respond. I keep stopping and asking you to respond because I'm trying to engage you in this virtual environment. The chat, having students uh, use a whiteboard, show the screen, have students write on paper in a Google form, however you can ask them to respond hand signals, note cards. A lot of these old school tricks still work. Next, we want to make sure, oh, jam boards, great. Absolutely, that's what I'm saying. There's so much technology, but if you use a jam board, don't also use a Padlet and a Nearpod and 50 other things. Keep a perky pace. The last thing anyone ever wants to do in a virtual environment is listen to somebody like this. Maybe that's great for your nighttime meditation, but it's not good in a virtual anything. That is why I keep a perky pace in these. You wanna make sure that you're keeping their attention. Don't wait to teach, dive right in. Nobody has time anymore. And especially if you're in a virtual environment, you gotta just get right to it and let's move on. You wanna teach the stuff, cut the fluff. I referenced that earlier. These are tips directly from Dr. Anita Archer too. She is the queen of explicit instruction. So if you have a moment to check out her webinar, it is on our home site, homepage, but we can't have any more fluff. Like this is not like, all right, everybody, let's, I don't even know what fluff would be in the virtual environment. I mean, you might even think that me asking you how you felt in the beginning was fluff. It is not. That is an opportunity to engage you, to start to connect with you. And it's still important to remember the human element. Chunking information. That is what I was also trying to do. I stopped every three, let you breathe, asked you what you thought. Even in the virtual environment, it's really important. Our brains cannot handle more than 10 minutes of information at a time. What, what? Yep, that's true. And we will learn and form new neural pathways if we can take that information and meld it to something that we already know, which is why I keep asking you, what do you do with this? 
How does this show up for you? That's going to help you build stronger neural pathways in your brain. Guess what? Group projects still work. Having students collaborate and connect with each other, even in a virtual environment, is really fascinating. I've seen cool ways where students were collaborating, sharing videos with each other around science projects. Group work still works as long as you are being creative and still thinking about the other lessons we talked about. Virtual field trips. I mean, this has been fascinating in this world. Like you are in the other side of the world and we are connecting together. Like, isn't technology crazy? You can literally go anywhere in the world from your computer. And so can your students. So how can we use that technology to expand our students' worlds in a really cool, engaging way? Teach to their interests. That's another thing that's so important. Get to know them, know what they like, and then teach that way. And then, especially if you have been virtual this whole time for two years, as many schools have, think about offline learning tasks. Think about ways students can still engage in paper pencils or think creatively that isn't on a computer because I feel like, well, we all could use the break. So what do we have for you for this? We have an entire website, again, giving you resources on all of this, the teaching and learning remotely. We're going to send that to you in the chat. And this is what I keep sharing with you. We have a webinar. If you want to reiterate this, or sometimes it's helpful to hear another voice. Dr. Anita Archer, she helps us. Uh, she's the author of our Phonics for Reading Solutions, which again, are phonic, they're phonics resources for struggling older readers. But she's really great with explicit instruction, especially in a virtual environment. And we have that webinar available for free. And our blog, we constantly are adding really great ideas and resources on our blog, including strategies, things to consider, all of that. And we put the, um, we put the blog back in. And I just, let me redo slide number, like rule number eight. Is that what we need all the way back to number eight? Hmm. All right, give me one second. Somebody just asked me to show slide number eight. All right, while I'm doing that, who would like to, how are you currently engaging students? Hopefully this is what you wanted to see. Rule number eight, but how are you engaging students? In a virtual environment, what's worked for you? Is there something that's your go-to that no matter what? Great. Love to hear from you. And then we're gonna finish off with the last two. Student engagement above all. Breakout rooms, great. Oh yes, those have been a huge, those have been huge in Zoom. Less teacher-centered, students tend to switch off if they're listening for too long. Yep, Google Sites for resources. That's why I'm keeping a perky pace for you. I hope you don't check out. I know sometimes an hour is like, what? So I utilize a lot of uh, crazy bitmojis because I think they're funny to look at. Harkness tables, debates, Cami app. Currently my ninth grade students are building their own model house for math class. Yes, that's what we're talking about. Really interesting projects. They can absolutely still work collaboratively in a safe environment. Shared virtual note-taking, Amazing. So the last two, so we went from tech, a little bit more to the human element, progress over perfection. Cynthia shared, I've learned to be patient with my students and patient with myself while engaging our math curriculum this year. Taking the time to incorporate a skill in creative, engaging ways has been a lifesaver. It makes me feel better and I'm helping them be successful in learning. We tend to be so perfectionist in education, but I'll tell you, neuroscience proves it. Our brains literally grow if we make mistakes. And in fact, we learn best when we're right on the edge of things that are hard. So how can we give ourselves a break as educators and incorporate more opportunities for students to make mistakes? In fact, kids don't mind failing. When kids play video games, they fail 80% of the time. They actually look at failure as an opportunity to learn, but then sometimes they get into our math classrooms and what happens? 
They'll fail at their video games and try and try and try again. And then they'll freak out if they don't get it right the first time. What I loved about COVID, one of the silver linings is on a global scale, when the entire world was shut down, we saw imperfection everywhere. So this was, a, so what you're seeing on the screen, I took screenshots of it because it was great. Everyone was figuring it out. No one's ever gone through a global pandemic before. You had priests live streaming mass who didn't know a Facebook filter was on. You had newscasters that were also dealing with their children. There's a newscaster on the bottom whose husband ran through the back in his underwear. You had this other, he was on the BBC and his children came in. Then you saw his wife come in and then all of them crawled out backwards. I mean, that's hilarious. My aunt ended up live streaming her slippers while she was uh, watching mass and didn't know it. Cause we were like, wait a second, she's live streaming on Facebook. That never happens. And then this guy, he was on good morning America without any pants on what these are examples that we are human and it is wonderful to make mistakes. So I'm actually going to give you an example of something that just happened recently. Have any of you ever seen the U S show American Ninja warrior? Anybody, have you ever seen that? It's really fun if you uh, like watching people fail. <laughs> Actually, it is the most growth mindset show. What happens is each, each season, they have the opportunity to compete in these obstacle courses and they could win a million dollars. Now, it has been 12 years running and I think only three people have won a million dollars. Three out of 12 years. They fail and fail and fail again, and they get right back up and keep going. So this is me on an American Ninja Warrior gym course. You ready? I'm going to play that one more time in case you missed it. Just one more time. Yeah, I failed big time. But did I let that stop me? No, I did not. Luckily, I did not hurt myself. But that's the thing progress over perfection. It is okay to make mistakes. It makes us human. And honestly, our brains grow. We learn from each other and we build more connections. So I'm going to encourage you to think that done is better than perfect. Show your students that you're human. Share your struggles with planning. Normalize struggles. For you, learn something new. Screw it up. Keep going. I knew that going to American Ninja Warrior Gym with my nieces and nephews after not working out for two months was going to be a struggle, but I did it anyway. Mistakes and failures are how we learn. And right now, everyone was making mistakes during COVID. They're continuing to make mistakes. We just don't see it as often. So just continue to be you, imperfect, wonderful you, and let's encourage our students to do the same thing. And finally, the final piece in all of this and this goes back to what somebody asked, how do we take things off teacher plates? We're not going to. Nobody's going to take anything off your plate unless you do. So my final lesson is radical self-care. There's 24 hours in a day. If you don't take time for yourself, the time will be taken. You are having, you're in the hardest job. You've been in the hardest job. If you're a leader, you're a teacher, you are in the job of developing human potential, but you have to take care of yourself because nobody else will. I have some resources. There's a pro paper we'll share with you about self-care, avoiding burnout. There's some other resources on just adding more connection in a virtual or in-person environment. But I'm just gonna leave you with this. You need to give yourself permission. Permission to not know what to do, permission to be creative, to make mistakes, to try again, to be silly, laugh, sing, have fun. Let's remember what it feels like to be human, even though we can't be in the same room. So what are some ways to radical self-care? Please take breaks. Get outside if the weather's nice. Breathe. Get away from technology. Breathing helps. Just taking deep breaths. There's a technique called box breathing. You think about a box, you breathe in, hold it, exhale for three seconds, hold it again, do it again. Three deep breaths before you do a virtual lesson, before you meet with a family member can make all the difference. Meditation, even if it's for five minutes, 
Even if you're just sitting there saying, breathe in, breathe out. That's what I do just to calm your mind. Journaling. I don't know if you like to journal, but for me, journaling is very, very therapeutic. There is not one self-help book that I've ever read that doesn't include journaling. This is huge. And this goes back to, I forgot who said it. You need to set boundaries with work. No one else is going to set boundaries. If you allow it, they will, you will work. You will work. So how can you say no? Because you have to, to protect you. Please take a tech timeout. I am guilty of this. I will go from my computer to my phone, to my iPad, to the TV. We're not meant to be in front of technology this much. Let yourself rest. Your job is very hard. You deserve to take a break. Of course, eat healthy, move your body. And finally, think about ways that you can do an activity I called courageous compliments. If you've not done this today, well, you probably haven't, you don't even know what it is. <laughs> it's a way to connect a little bit more with each other. So what you could do is somebody in your life, give them a compliment, but here's the catch. They have to say, thank you, it's true. So I'm gonna compliment you. Thank you for being on the session this morning. Thank you for being in education. Thank you for working so hard, doing what needs to be done for your students, working lot, long hours, really being creative. We appreciate you, we value you, and we are so grateful that you are doing this because students need you to be a champion for them. Thank you for your hard work. I hope this was helpful. You are appreciated. We will share all of these resources with you. And in fact, you have an entire team supporting you. A lot of your team members are live on this call with you. We have a whole team to support you. We'll send you a care package email, the video, but we hope that today was informative, enlightening, inspirational. And I just wanna say, we'll end with this. I encourage you to be the change you wanna see in your classroom, your school, and your lives. And we're gonna let Sarah Barrialis Be brave, everybody. Thank you so much for everything. I'm gonna just pause to see if there's any other questions. Keith, are your amazing partners on the screen? Don't know if Lynn, uh, if you wanna say anything, but just thank you, thank you, thank you. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, Danielle. As always, I feel better after this therapy session. <laughs> um, uh, somebody did ask for you to put up a previous slide. Um, I don't know what slide it was. And Number if you didn't catch it, we'll send you the recording and you can screenshot all the slides or yeah. you could take a, so if we can't find it, uh, this was being recorded and I can also, um, share just the 10 lessons, uh, as part of the deck too. So we can share that back with everybody. That'd be great. I Since think I went a little fast. I think Regina asked number one list. I'm not sure. You mean the first, very first slide or the last slide, the number one? Number one was just self-care. Yeah. Radical kind of, self-care. kind of important, Danielle. Yes. Yeah. If you don't take care of yourself, no one's going to take care of for you, for you. You got to fill your own cup before you can fill others. So go to your list of radical self-care. There you go. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, and we can stay on for a few minutes. If anyone, you thank you for doing what you do. And um, we're, we're very grateful to have done this with you all on your Saturday morning. And um, we appreciate you coming to visit with us. Ed, I don't Lynn, know. If Lynn and Charlotte and Danielle, thank you so very much for this. This was a, this was a treat. Uh, a lot of good information, a lot of energy, and uh, the interaction was really superb with everybody. Uh, really awesome. uh, very, very grateful for what we've had tonight or this morning. So I want to thank you all. And on behalf of all of us at Earcoast, I wish you continued uh, positive thoughts and great success in all that you're doing. And uh, 
We are going to have a conference together in person again someday, I promise, and I can't Yay. wait to see all of you there. As I said to someone the other day, you know, we probably won't even have to have presenters. We'll just have an open reception and let it run for three days. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but anyhow, thank you all for joining us and uh, really continued best wishes for all the great things you're doing for the uh, students in the region. And uh, Curriculum Associates, thank you very much. Thank you. And if anybody has any questions, we can stay on for a few more minutes, but we'll let Danielle have her Friday night. Um, but please let us know. We love Ear Coast. Uh, the feeling is mutual. Bye-bye. <laughs>